This is a unique podcast exploring the criminal justice system and those involved and affected. We'll educate and expose the public as well as potential jurors to what takes place behind the scenes of those who are facing the system. Your host owns a litigation support firm called Justice Technology Professionals, and he works on criminal and civil cases offering support to defendants and counsel. What you're about to hear is an open dialogue opening the minds to the public to what takes place in reality as opposed to what you think takes place ladies and gentlemen welcome to the justice tech pros podcast here's your host dominic crea hello listeners hope everybody's doing well it's actually uh, 3 15 a.m um, as you can see, I wanted to get this episode out. It's the 100th episode, and uh, people asked me if I was going to be doing anything special for the 100th episode. Nah, nothing special, just a regular episode. Um, the only thing is it may be a little longer because uh, I got a few things that I want to cover. So I guess that's what I'll be doing for the 100th episode. Maybe it's more. I don't know how long it's going to run. We'll see as I start talking uh, where this takes us. But I got a lot of things I want to discuss and talk about, and uh, I was looking forward to this episode, and I just haven't had the time to do it, just been busy with uh, different things, so I wanted to get it done now. So with that said, I want to uh, dive into uh, the indictment of pres- former President Donald Trump, and I just want to go into that. I figured I could I could do an episode on that without without really going into the politic aspect of it and just focus really on the items that I want to talk about, which I think are important. And if people could put uh, politics aside, I think they'll understand the bigger picture uh, in what I'm trying to uh, accomplish and what I'm trying to say. So for the time being, I I, I hope that you could just put aside any uh, uh, political affiliations, who you like, who you don't like, and let's just look at certain things to focus on that I would like for the public to understand why I have a problem with uh, Trump being indicted. Now, if you just go by accusations, right? If you go by things that were said about Trump uh, versus other politicians or other candidates, when you think about the accusations made about Hillary Clinton with all of those emails, I think those 30 or 40,000 emails that she that she wiped out from her computer. Uh, You think about that. You think about the accusations made against uh, Hunter Biden and Joe Biden. Um, Accusations made even uh, Watergate, right? Uh, That president was never indicted back from Watergate. So my point just is you hear all these different accusations, all these different things that uh, different presidents or politicians are accused of doing, and yet they chose to indict Trump, Trump based on what he was accused of. And I'm not going to get into what's worse. Um, I, I think the public has an idea of what's worse based on just things that are being said about Hunter Biden and things that are being said uh, about um, Trump and things that are being said against that were said against Hillary Clinton. That's up to the people to decide what's worse, what's not, and, and what's more severe and what isn't. That's not the point here. Um, uh, what I want you to focus on is according to the law they're trying to say all of those things are illegal okay i get that so all those things are are offenses that could be charged they're crimes that could be charged right so my question is why do you choose then to indict one person rather than the other if they're all committing crimes uh, based on the accusations now if all these different accusations have any kind of weight to them they're all committing crimes, correct? But yet they chose to just indict President Trump based on the accusations made against him. And now if that doesn't show you what they do, what the government could do when they don't like somebody or they pick and choose, I don't know what does. But this is a, is a prime example of when the government has a target and they want to they want to get that target. And it depends on who I guess is up for the task. So in this case, you had a prosecutor, an overzealous prosecutor uh, on the state level. Now, remember, this is a state indictment, not a federal indictment. 
Uh, the Department of Justice wouldn't touch it. A lot of prosecuting officers wouldn't touch it. I guess they saw that uh, it wasn't worth pursuing. Maybe it wasn't strong enough. Again, I'm not getting into that aspect, but what I am getting into, other departments decided not to pursue this, not to uh, go for an indictment. Uh, this prosecutor, Braggs, I believe his name is, which nobody heard of before this, but now a lot of people know his name, chose to indict former President Trump. Now, again, people could say why he did, why he chose to. Me, I, I just personally think maybe it's because I'm jaded. I think it has to do with a lot of times when uh, people pick a high-profile target, it could mean down the road different advances in their career whether it's some kind of promotion or different uh, positions that somebody may take, which may be a little higher than their current position, who knows. But that's how I see it a lot of times when you see these big targets and these big cases. Uh, if you follow what takes place after, you'll often see that the prosecutor involved or the team involved move on to bigger and better things. And I'm sure uh, this prosecutor the point was not lost on him that his name would suddenly be in the paper. He'd get a lot of recognition, get a lot of headlines if he did go through with it. And, you know, there's an old saying that you can indict a ham sandwich. And it's the truth. Um, it's just basically a, a, a way of putting it, whereas it's very easy to get an indictment. So you can indict a ham sandwich. Basically, you can indict anything. And the reason for that is just think about the indictment process, right? When somebody goes for an indictment, it's only one side of the story. You're only hearing the prosecutor give all their facts, lay everything out that they may have, um, uh, whereas they're pursuing some kind of indictment for somebody, and they're able to give all of their arguments, their side of what's going on, what they think this person is doing, how they think this person is committing crimes, and whatnot. So you're really just hearing one side of the story. You'll hear um, witnesses from that one side, and the witness will, uh, uh, you know, testify. But again, there's nobody to refute that witness. There's nobody to cross-examine them. It's just the one argument that you're hearing, just everything painted from the prosecution side. So obviously, with that said, it's very easy to get an indictment when that takes place. I want to also play for you a clip um, of a of a, uh, a press conference that President Trump had done after the indictment. And I just want to play certain segments because there's things uh, I want to talk about within that segment. It's like two minutes, so bear with me. I just want you to hear a few things and then I'm going to talk about it. You know, and this is where we are right now. I have a Trump-hating judge with a Trump-hating wife and family whose daughter worked for Kamala Harris and now receives money from the Biden-Harris campaign, and a lot of it. We recently had another trial, and the same judge told the fine man who worked for me for many, many years that if you admit your guilt, you will be in jail for 90 days. But if you don't, if we go through a trial and you're found guilty, you're going away for 10 years and maybe longer which for a 75-year-old man with a great family really means life. What the prosecutors and judge did to that man, I will never forget, because it's right out of the old Soviet Union. That's where we are. They said, you say anything about Trump, meaning that's bad, and you won't even have to serve the 90 days. You'll walk free. And they say that to many of my employees. We have this Jack Smith lunatic threatening people every single day through his representatives. They're threatening jail terms. But talk about Trump and you'll go free. This is where we are as a nation. Who would have thought they can't beat us at the ballot box, so they try and beat us through the law. That place, you know. I just wanted to play that. We are right now. Because uh, one funny side note, if you notice why Trump was talking, my uh, my um, my avatar guy was also moving its lips. That's because it's um, 
it's sound activated. So it tries to match your lips up a little better when uh, you're talking or whatnot. Any sound goes into the microphone. So I just thought that was funny. But anyway, the reason why I wanted to play that, if you notice the one part where Trump is talking about how the prosecution and the, and the um, I'd imagine the agents involved in the case were telling people from Trump's office, just tell us anything about Trump and you go free. Now, they didn't even try to vet the information. They don't even try to see if the person has anything uh, worth telling. They just look right away. That's what they do. They try to go to people, try to get them to give up information uh, in exchange for a bigger target. And that's how it works. What they'll do is they'll write them a blank check. And what I mean by a blank check, just whatever they want. Um, not only so much money-wise, just life-wise. Uh, no time. They'll set them up with a new job. They'll set them up with expenses. Whatever they have to do to, to uh, whatever they could do to help them in exchange for their testimony to talk about, in this case, to talk about former President Trump. And to me, it's just something important to highlight because just to see how they do operate, they um, they indict somebody, then they look to build the case and they look to get witnesses and they look to make deals. And I was listening to um, uh, Matt Maury. He's a uh, criminal defense attorney. And, you know, he raised a good point. He said how in uh, certain cases, um, especially when they have a target, it doesn't work like other criminal cases, whereas the law is broken, then this person gets indicted and then they, they build the, uh, I'm sorry, in, in normal cases, yes, when the law is broken, somebody gets indicted, if somebody's murdered, they get arrested, a crime is committed. A lot of these other cases where they pick a target, you'll notice they'll pick the target, especially in organized crime cases, they'll pick the target and then they'll build the case around that target. So they'll try getting uh, informants, they'll try getting uh, people to flip, quote unquote, uh, to talk about these individuals because they selected their target and now they want to build the case. And when you think about it, that's kind of an odd way of of uh, the justice system working, right? They'll look to, rather than identify a crime that's taking place and then solve the crime and put away whoever, whoever uh, took part in that crime, they'll pick a target and then build the case and then look to put the target away. It's just very backwards way of, of doing things when you think about it. And so many cases are done like that when they have a high profile target. Um, and in this case, I, I just really wanted to focus on and talk to the people <clears throat> about the aspect of it. It, it. I think the general public should have a problem when the government could pretty much select somebody they don't like for whatever reason and then build a case uh uh, based on that person or choose to indict that person over others who may have done equally as bad of a crime or deeds, whatever you want to call it. Somebody who may have done things equally um, that also needs some kind of accountability, but yet they choose to indict one and not the other. And that's where I have a hard time. Uh, with this pick and choose type law. Uh, law is supposed to be straight across the, the board. Same treatment for everybody, regardless of your skin color, regardless of who you are, regardless of your last name. And we don't see that playing out a lot. We see it playing out where they pick and choose. They pick who they want to indict. They let others go. And uh, based on whoever they want to indict, that's the, the case they're going to build. Uh, if they have a high-profile target they want to indict, then they'll try to, and maybe they don't have a lot of information on them, <clears throat> they'll try to get people to flip, tell stories, tell tales. Again, this just showed, very disturbing. They just went to employees of uh, former President Trump and just told them, like, hey, basically threatened them, or you're going to go do time unless you say something about Trump, then you won't do any time. And it's just... It's inconceivable how that practice is allowed where they're able to just negotiate like that by, I, I don't know, I would call it almost extortion. You're telling somebody, yeah, we're going to indict you and put you in jail unless you tell us what we want to hear. I mean, I'm sure there's more to it, but that's really it when you boil it down. Either you tell us what you want to hear or you're going to go to jail. So now say there's nothing there for the person to tell. That's why the government, they turn a lot of these informants into lying informants. Because a lot of times the informant may not have information on what the 
government's asking or what the prosecutor's asking. But, of course, the informant wants to get out of jail. So what do they do? They're going to make something up. If you dangle a carrot in front of them, especially somebody with uh, no moral compass and somebody who just wants to save themselves <clears throat> at all costs, regardless of who may be impacted, you dangle that in front of somebody, they're going to take you up on it. They're going to say whatever they got to say to get out of trouble. And that's just a dangerous card to play where you start saying, well, tell us about this person and you could go free. That's just a dangerous, dangerous card to play. And uh, they play it often. They play it um, often, <laughs> like I said, and they, and they continue to play it. They continue to play it on all different uh, cases. Here you have it with uh, former President Trump, President of the United States. We see it all the other time in other cases. I see it a lot of times in organized <clears throat> crime cases. Excuse me if my voice is a little off. I'm uh, getting a little bit of a cold and it's late, but I apologize for that. But anyway, my point just is I wanted to talk about that aspect of it. I wanted to talk, the, the general public just to think about that, just to think of the, of the facts, whereas it relates to President Trump and they chose to indict him. And yet we've heard all these other rumors about other politicians and, and other individuals in positions of power, and they weren't indicted. They, 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 uh, the prosecutor or the uh, law enforcement that was involved, they chose not to indict. And to me, if that isn't a siren going off to show people, well, look what they do if they don't like somebody or they, they want to pick a target. They just make it happen. It doesn't matter. They'll get the indictment. The indictments are very easy to get, as, as I explained, and uh, they'll get the indictment. If they want you bad enough, they're going to get it. And I, and I just feel the public should really think about that and focus on that. Whether you like Trump, hate Trump, that's all irrelevant. Just focus on the facts of it. They have an individual who's accused of certain things. There was also other individuals in similar position as he was accused of things as well, things that were illegal. Now, whether it's worse or better... That's irrelevant. Forget about that. They're saying that all of these things, each each accusations that are being made, whether they're against Hillary Clinton, whether they're against Donald Trump, whether they, they're against Hunter Biden or Joe Biden, people are trying to say that something sinister was taking place, crimes could have been committed. And yet they chose to pursue uh, the accusations made about Trump. You got to ask yourself, why is that and how is that allowed? Should not be allowed. You should not be able to pick and choose who you want to indict. There should be substance there. And that, I just wanted to raise that issue again. I, I don't talk politics. This was a non-political view on it. This was more of the legal um, standard that I wanted to kind of dissect. And over here, I see them taking that legal standard, throwing it out the window, and using the tools uh, available to them to... to to bend those tools and have them work in their favor for the indictment. Whereas <clears throat> they get the indictment, then they try to get witnesses, then they try to turn former workers, and who knows, try to get people to lie. I mean, if they got nothing to say, but they want a sweet deal, would you put it past somebody lying just to get that deal? I wouldn't. I've seen it done many times. People will lie to save themselves. Those are just the facts. Not saying everybody, but it happens time and again. Innocent people go to jail over witnesses or informants lying. That's a fact. That's not me making it up. <clears throat> so I, I, that's about it as far as the Trump part. I'm going to leave, uh, leave that alone. But I do think it was an important um, aspect to kind of reflect on. And I think it was something that I found interesting and something that I felt kind of related to everything I do here. Hence why I wanted to bring it up. The other thing I wanted to get into is a little bit about We Push Back. Uh, more specifically, a couple weeks back, some people who, uh, they have those those channels, you know, those mob channels where they're infatuated with guys and they tell like their biography or they'll show stories about them, one of the few of those channels. They were going around uh, trying to say that We Push Back doesn't cover uh, Mikey Scars D. Leonardo. Now again, Complete nonsense on every level. Uh, these people, what they try to do is, I don't know if they're jealous or we push back or 
they, they probably don't like it because uh, you know they're fans of the informant, so they try to knock it every chance they get or or poke holes in it. So their latest rumor was, oh, they don't touch Michael D. Leonardo, Mikey Scars. Okay, that's a complete lie. He's up on the website. His stories are up. And let me just explain this, folks. <laughs> This is populated manually, okay? The website's populated manually. All this stuff has to be entered in manually. So things that come in from Pacer, if I buy things from Pacer, it's all a process. I'll have my office buy certain things, upload it. Uh, The other thing I've been doing, because it gets expensive to constantly buy stuff off Pacer, is uh, reaching out to a lot of the defense teams that a lot of these informants weren't involved with. And then I'll wait for the defense team to send me what they want to put up, and then I'll put that up. Um, I've been asking for a few um, cross-examinations. I want to really focus on that. A lot of these informants, when they were being crossed, I want to put that up, and I'll probably do a courts and session series on that as well. But my point just is, opposition, people who are against We Push Back, they're always going to come up with crazy things to knock holes in it. But this I just found funny because it's so easily uh, disproved uh, to be disproven. Uh, like I said, he has his own section as well. Uh, when these informants come up, I try to make notation. If I see them on YouTube, sp- spreading uh, tales, telling their stories, acting the part, uh, then I try to put them on our list and we try to add them to the website. And this is not only about YouTube informants or organized crime informants. This is any lying informant that ever existed ever. Now, I can't populate all that by myself. There's a lot of lying informants. So that's why I come on, I ask people to send me stuff, and they do. I get a lot of information. Sometimes people ask me not to put it on the site, or they'll ask me to wait for something. They may be working on something legally, and they don't want anything hitting. So a lot of times I just have to hold the information, and when the time comes, I'll put it up. And that's the good thing about this site, folks. This isn't a job. This isn't something that has deadlines. This is a hobby of mine. And my goal is to eventually have it fully populated with as much information and data as I can. And I even want to change the layout of it when I have time. I want to make sections with just the different lying informants names. So you'll have all different tabs as soon as you click on with all their different names. So you'll have a John Panisi tab, Jimmy Calandra tab, uh, whoever else is on the uh, the internet now. Uh, there's a lot of them on there. Excuse me if you hear my dog snoring. But uh, that's my eventual goal, where you have the different tags with the different informants, and then you click on the tag, and everything related to that informant will be under that tag. So they cross-examinations, any court filings, any, um, any filings from the defense team, any newspaper articles, all in one place based on the informant. Now I don't have it that way. I have the lying informant articles, and I put everything there. I break it up a little differently. But I'm going to play around with that. I do everything on the website myself. I may eventually hire somebody just to do the website, just to populate it. I don't know. i gotta, I got to think about that. So I just wanted to talk on that whole Mikey Scars thing, complete lie. I'm sure they'll come up with something else. At the beginning, it was I was paying everybody, right? <clears throat> that was their big, uh, their big go-to. A few of those uh, dopey channels were trying to accuse me. Uh, oh, he pays everybody, this and that. Okay, it's been over two years what we pushed back. Well, almost two years we pushed back. Not one person came forward and said I paid them. Paid them. You don't think by now. I mean, you don't got to be a rocket scientist to see what's going on in certain genres. It's a mess in certain genres. People fighting, airing out all the dirty laundry. You don't think by now somebody would have came out and said, oh, he paid me to do X, Y, and Z? Come on, you're a moron if you don't believe that. But anyway, as I always say, the truth comes out in time. And once again, everything I said is uh, turning out to be true. I never paid nobody. I never told anybody to do anything on my behalf. I never asked anybody to do anything on my behalf. I do everything on my channels myself. And anything I want to talk about, I talk about. Now, people, supporters who are content creators, they may take my material and use it, uh, create videos on it. And that's the whole point of We Push Back. That's what it's about. It's me putting stuff out there. It's other people putting stuff out there. And then it's coming to one hub where you could see all that stuff. So if I see other content creators putting up useful information about the lying informants, it's going to go on the website. And that's where it will be one hub. It will house everything, all different people doing their own material. I see stuff that comes up 
that uh, they don't know about we push back. They don't hashtag we push back, but they're covering lying informants. I put them on the website. Anything like that, it's going to go on the website. It's going to get populated on the website. And that's why the website's ever-changing. Um, it's organic. It's constantly adapting. It's growing. I have different ideas, different things I want to do for it. So who knows what the finished product's going to finally look, look like. I've been in talks with a couple of strategic alliances I spoke about. I'm not rolling anything out yet. I'm waiting on a few things, but I have two... Uh, Two people specifically that are very interested, that I'm excited about bringing in and and um, collaborating with. So we'll see how that plays out. Um, but again, uh, one thing about we push back is I like to take things, uh, do things in different steps and at different times for different reasons. I can't get into everything, obviously, but there's a lot of. Um, a lot of these informants, let's just say, affected a lot of defendants and a lot of defense teams. So different teams want to do different things at different times. <clears throat> so I always make sure I'm not impacting that in a negative way. So when I get a heads up about something, maybe hold off on doing something on a certain informant, I always make sure I adhere to that because the purpose of this is to help defendants, uh, help, the, uh, help prevent these informants from lying on other people and costing other people their freedom based on their lies. So that's always going to be what kind of guides my ship and navigates me on what to do, what not to do. I'm always going to have the best interest of the defendants, their families, and their defense team at the forefront when I make certain decisions. Sometimes, i got to be honest, it gets frustrating because I may want to put something out on something, but I can't because I don't want it to adversely impact anybody. So i got to wait, and that's fine. That's where patience comes in, folks. You have to learn patience. And, you know, I'm not going to get into too much detail, but people who follow certain shows and certain genres, uh, they witnessed, I'm sure, a lot of the chaos the last couple weeks. One of these hosts who was... Uh, he was a co-host with John Panisi for 100 episodes. They were like best buddies. Uh, apparently, I guess he's not too crazy about the old videos he did with John surfacing. Well, that's tough. That's how it goes. Um, as I always said, I have a collection of every one of these episodes. And little by little, I'm going to be rolling out all different episodes on all different informants from a lot of different sources that people weren't aware of. Oh, whether they did a quick Instagram live that somebody may have screen captured uh, my office <laughs> and saved it and, and using it to help people, using it for the appeal, using it for other things. Uh, there's a lot of things that pop up, a lot of comments, maybe Facebook comments that were made in different Facebook. A lot of that stuff I'm going to start rolling out, and that's all to show the public what goes on with these lying informants when they're done testifying. That's very important to me, and I think that's very important for the public to see. That when it's all over, they think the case is over, they think these informants are building a new life, starting over. Well, I want to show that that's not the case. And the best way to do that is to document their behavior. And that's, uh, you know, due to social media nowadays, you could document behavior pretty closely for people who are active on social media. And uh, these informants, they can't stay away, right? This is their new, uh, newly found path that they're going to explore but yet it sounds very familiar and they behave very closely to the individual that was involved in their old path, in their old life, right? But what do I know? But either way, it's important to document that. It's important to show the public that. And it's important for defense teams to see that because with the right strategy, it could be incorporated in a lot of ways, whether it's on trial or an appeal, whatever the issue may be. There's a way of using that information to help people, to help defendants who may have been lied upon. And uh, a lot of defense teams know exactly what I'm talking about. We brainstormed. I've had a few conversations with a couple current defense teams, and we're all pretty much on the same page with the power and the impact of showing what goes on with these lying informants after they're in court promising a new life on the 302s saying they want to change their life and these are all the bad things they did and now they're going to change things. So it's very important to show that that's not what took place. Not at all. One thing I just wanted to share, it's not really anything to do with my podcast, it's more of an engagement tool I was thinking about. Um, 
those who are familiar with Facebook, they have the uh, groups. I, I've spoke about that in the past where you could pick any type of topic and they'll have a group all about that topic. But I was thinking uh, content creators. You could kind of do something similar with your community tab. Obviously not as in-depth, but you could like start a, a conversation um, ask a question or something and really engage with your audience. I haven't had time to do that, but I, it's something I, I'm going to look into where you come up with an interactive topic and you could talk to your um, <clears throat> listeners. And I think that'll also get you, get you in the algorithm. I know everybody loves talking about the algorithm, but I think by that interaction, you responding, going back and forth, you could use that tool to help your channel out. It's just something I was thinking about that I'm going to start doing where you make it a little more engaging on the community tab. I know they have um, uh, people done like polls and things like that. I've seen that. But maybe some serious discussions, like in-depth questions that you could talk about and uh, go back and forth. I don't know. It was just something I was thinking about other content creators who may listen to my show. <coughs> Excuse me. It may just be a good tool to further enhance the channel and add to the engagement, maybe like a weekly topic, something I'm going to think about doing too. And I just wanted to share it like a weekly topic to talk about. And then you could go back and forth with your audience. But I, um, I just thought of it uh, when I was on face, uh, Facebook. I was thinking that would be good for YouTube to have like a community type thing, uh, like a group type thing. But uh, I figured maybe the community tab could be used somewhat just to spark a little bit of a discussion. Okay, for uh, this part, I just want to give everybody an update. So this is update time, update time, folks. So this is going to be an update on the case of uh, the, it's actually currently on the appeal stage for United States versus Matthew Madonna, Stephen Crea, Christopher Landonio, and Terrence Caldwell. Um, just a quick update, we received notice that the prosecution has to respond by June 13th. So that's actually pretty good news. I asked, I was pretty close. If you listen to the episode I did about the appeal, I said it was going to be about 90 days when I was going through everything. Uh, it was a lot of information, and I, I figured it was going to take about 90 days. This wound up being a little over 90 days. I think it's 95 or 98 days. So June 13th, they have to respond. And then what happens, folks, is they respond to our brief. Then we put in a rebuttal to their response. And then the judges get everything, and then they rule. And when they rule, they could either call in both sides and ask for a verbal argument, or they could just rule based on the brief. You don't know until the time comes. So June 13th, the prosecution responds. Then I'd imagine we are going to get about 90 days to respond, and then the judges will have it. So... I was glad in the sense that at least we got the date. They got to respond by June 13th. A lot of times I've noticed they'll drag it out. They'll ask for extensions, and that doesn't seem to be happening now. It seems like it's sticking to that time frame. So, uh, you know, we're moving along. Things are moving along in the right direction. Just the mere fact that we had uh, the Rule 33 brief approved on the appellate level uh, gave me a little bit of a positive feeling in the sense that they want to see the whole story. So I take that as a good sign, and the whole, all the defense teams took that as a good sign. So now we'll see. June 13th is our date. Then we're going to get that in, and then we have to do our thing. All the different defense teams, the four different defense teams, then look at whatever um, is related to their client, and then you respond. And then we put in our re response to that, our response memo. The judges get everything together. They go through it, and then they rule. And if they need to have a verbal argument, they'll call in the different defense teams. So I just wanted to give that update on that case for those who are also following along. The other thing I wanted to talk about a little bit briefly is uh, when you visit somebody at the BOP, uh, Bureau of Prisons, which is uh, the federal, federal system. <clears throat> and just something I want to reflect on because I, I visit... I visit different people. I visit family members, unfortunately. I also visit clients. And when you visit a client, it's a much better experience uh, because when you go on a legal visit, it's just not as crazy. You know, you don't have to um, uh, take off so many different uh, pieces of garment or clothing. Uh, it's a little more laid back 
when you go through because you're bringing in paperwork you're bringing in a lot of documents you still got to go through like the metal detector they they have or whatever they have but it's just not as intense when you go as a to visit a family member you got to get online with everybody they call everybody in it's a little more chaotic and one thing i was just thinking about you know it really makes such a difference when you have professional people just working at the <clears throat> at the facility and um i remember when i would go to uh uh, MDC, which is uh, uh, Brooklyn's detention center. It's in Brooklyn. And uh, they have MCC, Manhattan Correctional Center, I believe, and then Man MDC, Manhattan Detention Center. But it's in it's in Brooklyn, and that place is rough to visit. Let me tell you, it's very chaotic. And the people there, the staff, they are so miserable and nasty. I learned right away, just like, don't say anything, because <clears throat> I didn't want to get in an argument. Because one thing... I don't know, some people don't realize when they're visiting family rem members, yeah, you could argue with them and you could say whatever you got to say, but don't forget, you get to go home and your loved one's there. So I, that always stuck in my head through the years, you know, if I'd go see a loved one. Y you got to try to just, you know, do your thing, be quiet, go through the motions because you get to go home and you don't want to be known as like a wise ass or causing trouble or making things difficult. Because I feel they'll take it out on whoever you're visiting. And they may even make your, your visits even that much more difficult. But I, I was just thinking about that and reflecting. I was like, man, these people, they don't realize the ones who work there, you get some of the, some individuals who work at the BOP, they're just such miserable people. Even in the state, when I see state facilities, same thing. And I'm sure a lot of the lit listeners have some uh, interesting experiences and tales they could tell about the... Uh, nasty and rude behavior they've encountered when they're just trying to visit a loved one and i just never understood that you know like in brooklyn they would come out so nasty they're always yelling they throw like the you got to fill out these forms you know to get a visit <clears throat> they treat these forms like gold they decide who gets them first i mean it's like a big game and, and just when i was visiting uh, another facility in pennsylvania it was just such a different experience the people there i gotta say when they just do their job, you know, you can't have any complaints when they're nice, they're pleasant, they're just doing their job, just going through the motions. They're not trying to intentionally be difficult. It just makes the overall experience better. And I would think like the warden in the different jails and different prisons would require that because it could create a lot of chaos if you just got nasty staff personnel and you're just hopping up the the people visiting and then, you know, the impact that could have on the inmates, you know, it all goes hand in hand. And I don't think they realize that when you're miserable and you're treating people nasty, you're just adding to the experience and not in a good way. But it, it's, it's concerning when you see people just nasty and miserable and they know, they know loved ones are, are going through a difficult time. They, they, they're having to deal with that experience. It's not a great experience to go there, to go through the visiting. And when I see guards and uh, personnel just <clears throat> intentionally being nasty and difficult and answering rude, I tell you, it really hate, makes you just dislike people. That's why, you know, I'm not really a people person. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm good when I have to be, but deep down, man, you get so many people, just miserable bastards miserable bastards so i just wanted to talk about that a little bit I, I i i'm a member of some facebook groups too with different facilities and i always see the the uh, family members or friends complaining about it so i wanted to touch on it too and just talk about how <clears throat> it does make such a different experience when they're pleasant and they're just doing their job and they're not just nasty and rude and intentionally trying to make you have a difficult time i've seen like some places for example, that MDC, I would wear um, basketball shorts sometimes when I go on a visit, and I never had a problem with them. And uh, I probably visited like three, four times with the same type of shorts. And then one time I went, and I could tell the lady was just in a miserable mood. She's like, oh, you can't go in. And I just said, well, I, I wore them before, you know, it wasn't a problem. And she's like, well, it's a problem now. <laughs> I just laughed. I was like, okay, I'll be back. I went and I got... Uh, there was a store not too far from there, and I got another pair of shorts. But in my head, I'm like, what am I going to do? Sit here arguing? Then they're not going to let me in the, to the visit. And then my loved one doesn't get a visit, and I don't get to see them. So they, they really do got you by the you-know-what when you're in, their, you're in their domain, and there's not much you could do, and it gets very frustrating. 
So I do appreciate when you go and you get people who are pleasant and they understand your situation. Um, it does make a big difference. Definitely does. You know, one thing that really gives me a good feeling uh, that I see going on is the whole we push back thing. Uh, I know on, on YouTube people see it and the people who follow, they see it on YouTube and that's great. But a, a lot of people don't see what I see. They don't see the letters. And I mean, yeah, actual letters, handwritten letters that come into my office. They don't see the calls that come into my office. They don't um, see the emails my office gets from the website, visitors on the website. And also a lot of um, personal calls from f uh, family members of defendants. And I got to say, it's doing a lot of good people. Those who are involved, those who, who follow it, uh, the content creators who support it and make content on it, it's really doing a lot of good things. There's a lot of people who, um, who are in our corner. Anybody who's for We Push Back, there's a lot of people who are not on YouTube. They have nothing to do with YouTube. They're not even aware of the YouTube channel. They really just follow the website and what goes on with that. And I tell you, a lot of people have um, have shared with me how it's a breath of fresh air. They feel they have somewhere to go. Because you have to realize, folks, this none of this was around before we pushed back. Before I started We Push Back, there was nobody going on shows to refute what an informant was saying about them. There was nobody talking negatively about these informants. Uh, there was nobody, at least I didn't see it. I didn't see any of that. I seen a lot of podcasts talking about um, organized crime and telling stories, but I didn't see anything specific about the informants and debunking their lies and all that. And then <clears throat> people started getting together with similar mindsets uh, on uh, on YouTube, and that's where um, that's what gave me the idea of we push back. And then you could see what's you know what it evolved into. And the different content creators who continue to put out that material, uh, the different supporters. You got guys like Kane Shades, Unk, uh, Mob Rats Exposed, uh, Assassinino. There's all different channels that still um, uh, lying informants and their enablers. These channels are still putting out content. Some, you know, don't do it anymore, and, and I totally get that. I understand it. Uh, like I always said, folks. This is something where people are going to come and go, and it doesn't matter. Whatever they add, even if they add one thing, it's positive, and that one thing will be there forever. So even if they put up one episode, it will be there forever. You know, It doesn't matter if people come and go. Me, I'm in this for the long game. I'm not going anywhere. So I'll always be here doing my thing until maybe the time comes where I pass the reins on. But I'll always be doing my thing. So for me, it's nice to see people come into it, contribute then maybe not be active anymore come back into it then you have the the um solid ones who've been with me from day one i mean it, it's just great to see all that and i think that's a lot of a mistake some people i don't know some content creators i think they for some reason they think that i think if they say we push back or the hashtag that they got to talk about we push back no, never asked anybody to do that, never said for anybody to do that. All I've said is I always appreciate when people do that. If you have a show and you support We Push Back, that's great. You don't got to talk about We Push Back. I wouldn't expect you to. And I, I've just seen certain comments from certain people where they feel like, oh, uh, I heard comments like, uh, oh, um, I forgot what term they use, but basically like they've been left to themselves. Like, uh, and I, I honestly don't know what that means. I really don't know what that means. I mean, we all kind of do our own thing here. I don't hold anybody's hand who's in We Push Back. I don't tell them what to do. It's kind of like we all just do our thing. We're, we're all, if we, I'm not in chats often. I just, I don't have time. I'm not on shows. I haven't been watching much. But say I was in chats, I'd say hi to people in chats. Uh, once in a while, I will catch a late night chat, chat for some content creators who have some, or sometimes I'm in the car, I'll stop in and say I'm driving. You know, you can interact there, but I don't know, I just found it weird. I heard a few comments of content creators who said they liked We Push Back and they supported it, but then I guess they felt like We Push Back wasn't supporting them, and I don't know what that means. I don't know what that means. Listen, folks, I've known what I've done for, for people on here. I, I've helped people, and I'm not even getting into that. That's nobody's business, but people ask me for help and different things, and I've helped. I've given away hats. I've given away shirts. I give cash apps. I've bought content creators coffee. Nobody bought me coffee. 
Now, I'm not asking for nothing. Don't get me wrong. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm not complaining. So when I hear, I don't know, when I just hear comments that people try to insinuate, like, we push back, left, I, I don't get that. I'm we push back. Me. I'm, I'm we push back. So when people say that, I don't know what that means. And yes, the supporters who hashtag, they're all part of We Push Back. But I'm just saying when I hear people say that, I assume it's me because I'm the one who has the website. I'm the one who put it all up, you know, and I'm the, I would assume that's what they mean. So I just don't get that. So just to be clear, anybody who has a channel who supports We Push Back, who hashtags it, you do not have to talk about We Push Back. You do not have to bring it up. You don't have to hashtag it. I don't care if you come on my channel and you like it and you support, that's great. I, I value it. I appreciate it. I don't expect anything from anybody. I don't want anybody to do anything. So I, I think people in their head think something when it's just not accurate. And from some of the passive aggressive comments I've heard and some of the things that were sent to me, I could tell maybe certain people feel a certain way and I just can't relate to it because I don't know what that means. I don't know what it means when people like... Well, we push back to it and support us. Support you how? That's what I'm not getting. I know what I did. Again, I know the cash apps I've sent. I know the stuff I've given away for free. I've never asked anybody for anything. I've never asked anybody for a dime. I've never asked anybody to do anything for me. I've never asked anybody to share my channel. I've never asked anybody to share an episode. My, the people I'm friends with on here just do it. They just do it to do it. They don't do it for a pat on the back. They don't do it for, they just do it to do it. Same for me. When I share something I see, if I see it, I think it's something I like or something I can relate to, I share it. I don't want a pat on my back for it. I don't want an accolade for it. If I send somebody a cash app, I don't want an accolade for it. I don't want a pat on my back. I don't even want to mention. I'm doing it because I want to do it. Not for any other reason. If I didn't want to do it, I won't do it. I do things because I want to do it, not because uh, to say I did it or not to feel, uh, well, I should say it does make me feel good when I, when I do nice things. So if that's a, a selfish aspect, I'll own that. Yeah, I guess that's one selfish aspect of it. I do certain things sometimes to help somebody because I like the way uh, I feel when I'm able to help somebody in a certain way. Uh, so there's a, a certain, <clears throat> excuse me, a certain selfish point to it I get. But I don't know. I just wanted to clear the air with that because too many, too many uh, comments like uh, insinuating we push back, left this one. I don't even know what that means. There's no one to leave alone. There's no members in we push back. There's no organization. We push back is me with a website. And it's all the supporters, people who are behind it, people who hashtag it. Those are all we push back. We, you know, we don't got to talk every day. We don't got to hang out every day. We don't got to pat each other on the back every day and say, good job. That's just what you do when, you, when you're, when you're with, I, I know me, when I'm with like-minded people, we don't got to talk about what we're going to do. We all know what needs to be done and we just do it. And we don't cheer each other on. And we just do the job. Whatever needs to be done, we do it. And that's what a lot of, not a lot, but that's what a few of the uh, uh, content creator supporters do. I mean, that, that Kane Shades, uh, me and Kane Shades will go weak sometimes. We may not chat or talk, but he does his thing. He'll do his stuff on uh, lying informants. Mob Rats Exposed, same thing. We may not talk for weeks. He does his thing. He's doing episodes on, on lying informants. That channel, Lying Informants and Enablers, may not talk. I don't even know whose channel that is, but I like it. Got some good stuff to it. And... Uh, he just pumps out content. I'll notice I'll drop something. He'll pick it up and he'll run with it. And that's what it's about. That's what it's about. Different creators taking the stuff and running with it. Some still do it. Some moved on to other things. That's what it's about, folks. And then new people may come in. I'm, I'm, I'm eyeing a few content creators in completely different arenas. Uh, that I think may be a good segue or we may mesh well. I think they'll enjoy it. So my point is you may get a, you know, maybe I'll bring in one or two content creators. They may make a, uh, put out a couple episodes just to bring attention to it. And then that's it. That'll be the end of it. That's how it works. It's keeping it all just out there, keeping the hashtags going. That's why, you know, when people hashtag, that's important. That's a great thing because it brings attention to it. So I hope I didn't go off too much on a tangent here. Uh, I just, I, I wanted to vent a little bit about it. I may not have been as crystal clear as I, as I would like to have been, uh, but when I'm venting sometimes, <laughs> maybe my thoughts don't come out as eloquently as I would like them to, but 
<laughs> I think I got my point across. You know, one other thing I wanted to touch on, um, especially after like last week where I was putting out some information uh, on John Panisi and some of his antics on uh, social media. And I was showing some episodes with his co-host, Tom Lavecchia. But my point just is, during that time, I found it funny because uh, that co-host, Tom, he had made a post on his community tab, uh, threat, uh, basically, uh, and I said this on the episode, I'm not going to rehash this, but I'm, I'm telling you why I'm saying this. Basically, he was saying that like he was getting threats and he blamed me and I guess my family is some some nonsense. And he said, you know, uh, he was getting he was talking to agents and they told him it was threats. And I uh, just whatever. I found that amusing because it's moronic on every level. I've never threatened anybody. Again, I'm not going to get into what I said. All I had to say. The reason why I'm bringing this up, he talks about threats. You know, the difference with me and all these other people on here is I'm not on here crying about it. People should see the threats I get and the things, uh, the comments I made, and the comments made at my expense. And I save all of that, and I'll tell you why I save it. I don't save it to go to the law. It's not my style. It's not for me. I save it to protect myself because if and when, say, something happens, uh, somebody comes for... You know, they, they're they really aggravating. They want to stop by my office and they get really heated and maybe something happens, whatever. You got to have information to protect yourself, to show what took place, to show what's being said. And it's funny because I think these people think I get insulted if they don't like me. And like I'll see a lot of the informants make nasty comments at my expense like, oh, I can't stand that guy. They're not understanding something. That's the way it should be. They should hate somebody like me because I'm against everything they stand for. So they should never... I get bewildered. I'll talk to some people, not friends in real life because they wouldn't think it's a compliment, but people like on YouTube, I've seen them say, oh, well, this informant said this about me, so he's not too bad. Like the guy may have said something nice. Ladies and gentlemen, I can't relate to that on any level. If an informant ever said anything nice about me... I would think I failed. I would look in the mirror and say, what the hell am I doing wrong? This person should not have anything nice to ever say about me. And that's how I feel about their friends and their enablers. None of them should have anything nice to say about me, ever. So I get it. I'm not confused by it. That's why I laugh when, like, this content creator was going nuts. Oh, I'm being threatened. You're being threatened. I'll show you a book of threats, pal. I'll show you a book. I got Facebook. I got snapshots from a Facebook page a while ago. Some ridiculous content creator. He has like these new cl- news clips channels. He was like putting up posts about me every day with all these conspiracies. He was the one I'm paying people and t- all that. But anyway, one of his friends, you had to see the threats he made on the on Facebook about me. One of his friends right on his page. Oh, I'm going to find him. I'm not even going to get into what he said, but all kinds of physical threats or, and again, I don't go to law. I'm not. A, that's not my style to show that, like, threats to me. I don't know. I, I'd feel like less of a man if I was actually that shook over something on the computer. <laughs> I mean, but whatever. And I'd feel even less of a man if I had to go to somebody about it and I couldn't handle it myself. I mean, as a man, you got to handle certain things yourself. So my point just is I see all these threats, and I don't get that shook by it or rattled by it to me it's like okay yeah that's normal that's what they should be saying about me anybody who aligns with informants who uh, protects informants who interviews they should not be able to relate to me on any level they they just shouldn't because you know i don't agree with what they do so i understand it when they call me names and i just i don't know i i i get so confused when i see content creators almost using that as like a brag, you know, they'll be like, oh, well, this guy said this about me, so he's not that bad. He had some nice things to say. Man, <clears throat> they better not have any nice things to say about me. I'll feel like I failed. <laughs> so I expect all the abuse. I expect all the comments. I expect all the threats. What does that mean to me? Absolutely zero. Nothing. It means nothing, folks. It's going to continue. It's going to probably get worse as I start, especially with some of the things I'm going to be rolling out soon. I'm sure it's going to get a lot worse. I'm going to have a lot more coming my way. 
And as I always do, I'll ignore it. It means nothing. Not my concern. I focus on my page, my material, and my content. That's it. I don't go on other pages and promote my stuff. I don't go to the lying informants channels and write we push back. I don't care what they're doing. Let them all do what they're doing. I don't care. It's irrelevant to me. It has no impact on my plans. And I don't focus on things that don't impact what I'm working on. So all of those things are irrelevant to me. And I just focus on what I got to focus on. And as far as uh, people where they get confused, that they get threats, you're on social media, people. You're on social media. You're, you're dealing with anonymous people. They have the safe space to abuse you, to insult you, to threaten you. You got to get used to it. If you're on social media, you got to either get have tough skin or, I don't know, don't be on it. Because you have to realize it doesn't mean anything. What does it mean in, in, in the grand scheme of things in life? What does it mean somebody's abusing you on the internet? Okay, so what? So what? How does that impact my life? Does it affect my paycheck? Does it affect uh, what I'm doing? Does it affect my daily routine? No. It doesn't. It doesn't affect anything. So why would I care? Why would I harp about it? So for those who maybe it bothers, you can't let these things bother you. You really can't. Got to let it roll off your back. And when you see something you don't like, do an episode. But don't, don't get into a back and forth and all that. Like for me, if I see something that's important that I need to clarify, uh, like I had to do that a couple times in the past with different content creators. They would say something that I felt I just needed to clarify. That's what I do. I go on and I memorialize it. I want it on the internet. I want it housed here. And I want it. Uh, I want my statements pretty much set in concrete. I want what I say out there so people could say, can't say, oh, you didn't do this, you didn't say that. It's all there. I could say, I'll oh, go listen to the episode. And then that's it. I move on. I find that to be the best way to really approach that, you know, because sometimes, even for me, I ignore a lot because it's nonsense. But sometimes there's things I can't ignore and I want to voice my opinion on it. And that's how I do it. I like to just do an episode. I don't get into the back and forth. I don't see the point in that, folks. The way I was raised, like conflict like that, if you're heated, that's got to be done face to face. Not over phone or over internet. Conflict like that, if it gets heated and escalates, it's got to be face to face. Really does. Otherwise, what's the point? I'm not a screamer. I don't yell. I'm not. I'm just. I never was. I'm not that type. So for me, it'd be pointless on the computer. I'm not going to be getting into a screaming match. If somebody wants to debate me. They want to have a heated discussion. Again, I say it all the time. Six days a week, I'm at my office. Six days a week, people could stop by. They call my secretary. Uh, make an appointment, come see me. You want to have a free consultation. <clears throat> you want to have a cup of coffee. You want to yell and say my uh, podcast sucks. Well, whatever you want to do. Come see me in person. We can talk about whatever you want to talk about. That's why I don't, I don't really pay attention to the nonsensical uh, threats and this and that tough guy talk and uh, uh, insults. It's, it's all nonsense, folks. It's it's idle nonsense threats, and they mean nothing. And uh, people should really start to put things in perspective and understand. Use this social media, use YouTube as a positive experience. If it's negative, that's because you're letting it be negative. Don't let it be negative. Cut out all the negativity. Do whatever you need to do to make it a positive experience. If certain people bring you down, get rid of those people. If certain topics bring you down, get rid of those topics. Don't do the topics. But you control it. You control your space. You control your material. So you do what you want to do. Me, I like doing uh, controversial stuff. I like mixing it up. I like putting out what I got to put out with these informants. I'm not going to back down. That's what I'm going to keep doing. But that's the material I like. I enjoy that. I don't mind what comes with it. Other people, they may not want to be bothered. And I don't blame them. If you don't have to be bothered, why? My job, uh, things I had to deal with in my personal life, they all kind of go with this whole theme, you know. So, so for me, when I talk about these things, it's a bit of, it's therapeutic actually. And it's, I get to vet a little bit because these are things I experience. But for others, it goes back to what I was saying before, folks. Like I have people, oh, I want to support, we push back. You support it just by watching it, just by sharing it. You don't got to talk about it. You don't got to bring it up on your show. Just, just share it. Just bring attention to it once in a while. That's it. That's more than appreciated. That's more than, and you don't even got to do that. 
That's only if you ask me what you could do. Other than that, just by you listening to material is enough for me. Just taking the time to listen is enough. Too many people don't take the time to listen. And that's the problem. People don't take the time to listen, understand the whole situation. And that's, that's the problem with being a juror. That's a problem in society. People don't take the time to listen and think before they react, before they talk, before they judge somebody. They don't, they don't look at all the pieces of the puzzle. They only look at what they want to look at and then make a, make a conclusion as if they've, they've been uh, uh, analyzing something for weeks and they finally have, have this solution when in reality they just looked at something briefly and they already formed an opinion. And that's a big mistake. And that's what I try to bring here. I try to teach people that on the jury level, they just can't do that. And hopefully, by them not doing that, people will get a uh, more of a fair trial. And it will prevent maybe some of the wrongful convictions that we see. And that's really all my goal is. For this 100th episode, I thought it was pretty good. It didn't go on as long as I thought. Uh, I got out what I had to get out. But uh, I, I covered the topics I wanted, wanted to cover. I hope I hope you guys enjoyed it. And wow, I can't believe I did a hundred of these. Amazing! I can't believe. Come November, it's going to be four years. Four years. You believe that? I can't believe it's going to be four years. I started the YouTube channel. It's funny. I started it in 2017, I think. Yeah, 2017. I posted a promotional video I did, and I just posted it on YouTube so I could share it on my uh, on my uh, website. But I didn't actually start doing podcasts till uh, 2019. And that's it, folks. It's 4.30 in the morning. I'm not going to get any sleep because I actually have a 6.30 appointment. But I will get sleep when I get back. So I'm going to go to that appointment, do what I got to do, <laughs> and then come back. And uh, try to get some sleep before I go out again. But I hope everybody enjoys their Monday. Till next time. You've been listening to the Justice Tech Pros podcast with Dominic Crea, one of the most unique podcasts on the internet, discussing the obstacles the defense team faces when trying a case, what goes on behind the scenes during pretrial and motion phase, holding defense attorneys accountable, making sure they're fighting for their clients, the difference between textbook law and how things truly play out in a courtroom, and everything in between. And everything in between. We hope you've gotten some useful and practical information from this show and we'll be back soon until then find us on twitter facebook and instagram at justice tech pros to email the show with questions and comments it's podcast at justice tech pros.com till next time this is justice tech pros podcast and dominic crea signing off